Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining this parallel session on inequality. My name is Carlos Gradin, and I'm a research fellow at Unwider in Helsinki. So for this session, we have three distinguished scholars who will review various dimensions of the effects of the pandemic on inequalities. The session will focus on the labor market and policies, as well as domestic work and leisure. We will see evidence from South Africa, from India, and from Latin America. So the first speaker will be Mara Leibrand. Uh, he's director of the Southern Africa Labor and Development Research Unit, Saldru, at the University of Cape Town. He's also a non-resident, senior research fellow at Unwider, and he works on many topics related with economic development, particularly in poverty, inequality, or the labor market. The title of this first presentation is Pre-Pandemic Labor Market Status and Labor Market Restructuring Under COVID, Persistent or Change. Then the second uh, presenter will be Ashwini Deshpande, who is professor of economics at Ashoka University in India. She works on economics of discrimination and affirmative action with a focus on caste and gender in India. She's also a non-resident senior research fellow at Unwider. And the title of her presentation will be the COVID-19 pandemic and gender division of paid work, domestic chores and leisure, early evidence from India. And finally, we have Isor Dalaport, a research fellow at the School of Geography and Sustainable Development at the University of St. Andrews in the UK. She's a member of the Population Health Research Group. Her research interests include migration, labor economics, demography, and development. The title of her presentation is The Distributional Consequences of Social Distancing on Poverty and Labor Income Inequality in Latin America and the Caribbean. We will play all three presentations in a row, 10 minutes, uh, about 10 minutes each. Uh, while we, the presenters, we all turn our videos and audio off, and later after the uh, in this presentation, we will have some time left for discussion with the presenters uh, here. Please feel free to address your questions or comments using the Q&A tool, and don't be shy and you can request to ask the question yourselves, otherwise I will read them on your behalf. Thank you very much, and we can go with the first presentation. Greetings, everybody. I'm Mary Labrant and I lead a UNU wider work stream on the SA Tide project in South Africa with the National Treasury on turning the tide on inequality. And it's a pleasure for me to be participating in the session on inequality and COVID at the wider development conference. I'm bringing to this session some evidence from South Africa on social grants and employment over the pandemic. This is the course of the pandemic in South Africa. One can see uh, COVID arrived in early 2020. It peaks, it, it starts to rise and peaks in the middle of the year. Then it wanes and falls again, builds up for the second wave around December, January 2021, falls again and then actually rose and had, we had our third wave in June, July of this year. So associated with this trend, government imposed a very strict lockdown in March and April of 2020, right here. And then another uh, strict lockdown and uh, strict policy measures here in June, July of 2020. And again in December, and actually again recently in our country. We are going to follow the, the impact of the, this pandemic and the impact of policy, emergency policy, through something called the NIDS CRAM survey that followed 7,000 South Africans through the pandemic uh, off the basis of a pre existing national panel study called the National Income Dynamics Study. Uh, and the, this graph also shows you the waves of NIDS-CRAM data collection. Uh, here's the first wave right 
uh, straight off to the end as part of the strict lockdown. Here's the, um, here's the second wave of data collection, third uh, towards the end of the year when it's spiking again, uh, 4th in February and 5th here in, uh, in April and May. Um, so let's see what this nerds cram story tells us. It was a remarkable uh, exercise of, of the whole of South African social science and uh, able to use this national panel study um, and had to be done telephonically, of course. South Africa has a very extensive grant system uh, with a number of prongs, a child support grant, an old age pension and others. And over the 10 years, between 2009 and 2019, it was rolled out even further from 14 million in 2009 to 18 million in, uh, in 2019. However, despite that, or using that as the base of our emergency response in the four months um, of, of uh, uh, first four months of the pandemic, an additional 4.2 million people had received COVID SRD grants, a social relief of distress grants that government rolled out as one of the emergency relief measures. A very minimal amount of money, 350 rands uh, per month, um, but rolled out to 4.2 million people, plus top ups of the child support grant and the old age pension. And then some labor market interventions as well for the formerly employed who had lost their jobs. Uh, and then the social relief of distress grant was supposed to be targeted at, at more informally employed. So we had a decade's worth of, uh, of growth in grants over four months. What was the impact of that? The, the, the NITSCRAM survey served as the basis for a micro simulation model that was done by one of the projects in SA Tide to assess the impact of the COVID-19 of the benefit changes that had taken place, the top up of the grants, the social relief of distress, and then the employment interventions. You can see uh, in the gray here on the graph that earnings are negative and earnings growth is negative. It's, it's mildly negative for the bottom decile. That's because the, the links to the labor market are so poor for people there. But you can see the, the, the low earnings growth across the distribution in South Africa as the pandemic um, in the first six months really devastated the labor market. On the other hand, you can see the COVID related benefits made a substantial contribution to changes in household disposable income, very well targeted at the poorest of the poor in the bottom deciles, uh, and, the, and so that's an, a considerable achievement of these grants. And this work uh, illustrates the importance of the grants. That said, these, uh, these bottom deciles were very, very poor to begin with. And so that doesn't mean that this is sufficient money to, to help uh, households entirely cope with the impacts of the grants uh, of the pandemic. I'm sorry. And I give you one table to illustrate this point, table of hunger. One can see that in April 2020, the hunger levels that's under the strict lockdown, uh, the pandemic had just arrived, the hunger levels were higher than they'd been historically for the preceding 15 years in our country, way higher, substantially higher, 47% uh, uh, of, of people in the Nitz Cram survey ran out of money for food. Um, and across the board, different measures of hunger, you can see the spike in uh, April. This does fall as the grants kick in, and that's an important point to note. But it's also important to note that the hunger seems to stabilize at a new, much higher level than historically. South Africans found it hard to cope with COVID. The grants helped, but they were only assistance. They weren't uh, completely able to save people from hunger. Focusing on the, on the employed then, on the labor market side, we had uh, 2.4 million extra jobs created in the decade leading up to the end of 2019. 
With the pandemic arriving, employment plummeted. According to the NISCRAM survey, we lost 2.8 million jobs between February and June 2020. According to the Statistics South Africa survey, we lost 2.2 million jobs between quarter one and quarter two of 2020. The NISCRAM survey, so a decade's worth of job loss in six months, equivalent to all that we'd gained in the preceding decade. The NISCRAM survey shows this quite graphically. I'm sorry, got too excited. The NISCRAM survey shows this quite graphically. One can see in February, the, the survey asked people what they were doing in February as a way of benchmarking the impact in the move from February to April with a pandemic starting in the middle. You can see the not employed growing dramatically from 13.7 million to 16.5, and then stabilizing at that level of 16.5. The working falls from 17 million to 12.5, and the furloughed, in other words, those who have a job, but aren't working and aren't being paid. It's not a category that we thought about in our country before COVID arrived. Uh, the furloughed grows by 2.4 million, that's quite substantial. And then shrinks a little bit as, as we move out of the harsh circumstances of, of the uh, April, May period in June. The longer run picture from Nitz Cram following that on, we can see that then as we go to October, the furloughed fall again, but notice also the actively employed rise much more than the fall in the furloughed. And you can see that those who were out of the labor market or not employed also make up a portion of the, the jobs gained. They're under the second wave, employment suffers again and then recovers almost back to its February 2020 level. Um, and, uh, but again, that gain is split between those who had had positions before this pandemic struck, who had been employed, and those who had not. So it's a textured story and is worth it pushing a bit. I'll, I'll end off my presentation with two aspects of that textured story that is both a bounce back, if you like, of existing employment situations and ex existing economic activity and a restructuring of the labor market. The gender story is particularly important and I'm sure Ashwini will have much to, to say about that in a different context. In the South African context, the, whilst males did recover to their February 2020 levels, that is certainly not the case with females. They did not recover to the same level. And, and so some of the burden and the restructuring was borne by women in the labor market. It's a signal that, that there was this recomposition happening as well. And it is unfortunate that the most disadvantaged were further disadvantaged. In addition, if you add to the fact that women then were not the recipients of the formal sector employment jobs because they don't bear most of those jobs, the relief for, for those who had lost jobs from the formal sector or uh, the social relief of distress grant, which was given to people who weren't grant recipients or weren't receiving grants for their children even. So women bore double burden. But my point, main point here is that the labor market didn't just bounce back in a neutral way, it was restructuring. My final point about that was that, uh, to give you some statistics about those who, who, who moved into employment who were not employed in February, about 23% of the February employed were no longer employed a year later. They hadn't come back into the labor market and weren't part of the labor market. Yet 30% of those who were, who were not employed in February 2020 were employed in March 2021. In particular, the youth took up a large chunk of the new jobs or the new created jobs, if you like, over the pandemic, and particularly youth with complete secondary schooling or complete um, or post-secondary training whereas older adults experienced the largest decrease in employment. So there was restructuring happening in the labor market and understanding that texture of that restructuring is crucial to exploring the poverty and inequality impacts of 
the pandemic in the labor market. Thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for inviting me to present in this very important conference uh, organized by UNU Wider. I'll be presenting uh, the results from a recent paper that looks at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and on gender division uh, of paid work, domestic chores and leisure uh, based upon evidence from India in the first wave uh, and its aftermath uh, up to December 2020. Female labor force participation in India has been stubbornly low and has registered a decline over the last two decades, despite favorable preconditions of declining fertility levels and increasing female education, which elsewhere in the world uh, would lead to an increase in female labor force participation rate, but not in India. That issue is, has been and continues to be extensively analyzed. In this paper, I am specifically looking at the impact uh, that COVID-19 had. And why would this be of particular interest? It's because during the Spanish flu epidemic, there is evidence that as a result of the mortality of men in working age groups, uh, there was an increase in female employment uh, in India. And you know, so it, it's, it's interesting to see whether the COVID-19 pandemic and its economic impact, uh, you know, its, its aftermath had any similar impact. Now, when you look at the literature uh, on the economic impact of the COVID-19 induced lockdowns, you find that more uh, women uh, in absolute numbers lost jobs than men in several countries of the world, including in the United States. So this is not difficult to understand because COVID-19 imposed social distancing norms, as a result of which several sectors where, uh, which are you know, female intensive sectors or that employ a large proportion of women closed down. Uh, hospitality, entertainment, retail spaces, and domestic workers such as caregivers, nannies, et cetera, au pairs, could not uh, go to their places of work. So that, that was a direct effect on uh, women's employment. The indirect effect was caused by increased childcare burdens and homeschooling burdens as a result of the fact that schools and childcare centers were also closed for prolonged periods. As a result of this, women who uh, continue to have jobs and who could work from home uh, found it difficult to balance the multiple pressures of work, working from home as well as childcare and uh, homeschooling and dropped out of the labor force. That led the New York Times to run a story which said, in the COVID-19 economy, you can have a kid or a job, you can't have both. What was the picture from India like? So I look at a panel data set um, and I choose a period of um, two years, starting in January 2019 and ending in December 2020, that allows, uh, uh, you know, because it's a panel data set, is, it allows us to look at the same individuals pre-pandemic which I defined till March 2020, and post-pandemic, which means after the onset of the pandemic, uh, till December 2020. Now, overall, uh, in India, the result in, uh, for employment is that more men lost jobs in the first month of the very strict lockdown, that is April 2020, than uh, women. And this simply reflects the historical and significant gender gaps in employment and labor force participation rates. Looking at panel estimates, if you just do a difference in differences by constructing a panel of individuals that were observed in, um, uh, you know, uh, th that was this pre and post uh, two periods, you find you see that there's a decline in the probability of male employment, which is greater than a decline in the probability of female employment. So you see a closure of gender gaps. Uh, in the post-pandemic period, but this is driven by a probability, uh, a decline in the probability of male employment rather than an increase in the probability of female employment. And coming to panel B, we see that this result is driven by men with low levels of education, that is with 10 years of less of schooling. Uh, and this is not surprising because as a result of the lockdown, it's really the informal sector in India, which is very large as well as factories, et cetera, that closed down 
uh, and these are uh, predominantly employers of men with lower levels of education. So you see that getting reflected here. Instead of just doing a pre-post panel, uh, one could also do a kind of an event study uh, analysis where you look at each wave. And I'm, you know, I ran a couple of models here, but I'm presenting the effects, uh, the results of the dynamic panel data model because lagged employment is the strongest predictor of uh, uh, current period employment. And you see that accounting for lagged employment effects um, you know, women in August 2020 were 9.5 percentage points less likely to be employed uh, compared to men. So this is, you know, comparing August 2020 to um, um, August 2019, right? So it's a pre-pandemic pre month. However, by December 2020, the gender gap in December 2020 in employment was the same as August 2019, so as same as the pre-pandemic. So by December 2020, the gender gap had gone back to the same level. Women were not more likely, but the gender gap had gone back to the same level as far as employment is concerned. If you look at hours spent on housework, you see that, uh, again, a well-known fact about South Asia, India, Pakistan uh, in particular, which is that uh, there's great inequality in the hours spent on domestic chores. So women spend uh, far greater amounts of time on domestic chores than do men. And you see that gap here in the December 2019 figures. By In April 2020, which was the first month of the strict lockdown where domestic helpers could not get to their places of work, you find an increase in the male hours spent on housework. This seemed like a, a, a pleasant uh, change, uh, green shoots of gender equality in the making, except that by December 2020, the gender gap in domestic chores had actually worsened relative to December 2019. When we look at leisure, which is here measured by time spent with friends, uh, the picture shows you uh, the estimates for rural and urban areas separately. You see that in both rural and urban areas in December 2019, women you would spend more time with friends than did men. And in April 2020, the first month of the strict lockdown, you see a sharp decline in both male and female hours uh, of time spent with friends. By the time we come to, there's a slight, slight increase in August uh, 2020, but again in December 2020, you see a decline. Uh, and so, which is still not as low as the worst period of April 2020, but it's still not nowhere near the time spent in uh, December 2019, which is the pre-pandemic period. And this has adverse implications for emotional well-being and could you know, well contribute to stress, anxiety, and feeling of isolation that anyway engulfs all of us as a result of the pandemic. So in conclusion, what we find is that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic did not uh, reverse the established gender gaps in employment uh, pre in the pre-pandemic period. So the gender gaps in employment in December 2020 were back to their pre-pandemic levels. Um, looking at domestic chores, the gen gender gaps had clearly worsened as the economy unlocked. Uh, in terms of leisure, the time spent with friends, uh, the gender gap, gender gap had declined, uh, but uh, both men and women were spending far less time on uh, with friends compared to uh, the time that they spent in the pre-pandemic period. So, uh, you know, overall, the picture is fairly grim, and it certainly doesn't point towards any reversal of the, of the you know, the uh, deep-rooted gender inequalities in the Indian labor market and in Indian society. Uh, you know, just casually looking at the recovery in employment since December 2020, you know, just looking at the numbers, we see that the recovery has been uneven and not robust. So it doesn't seem to be probable that there will be a, you know, in the any 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 uh, time in in the near future, a reversal of the historical gender inequalities uh, that have plagued the Indian labor market. So. Uh, I think policy needs to very clearly focus on what can be done to uh, remedy this uh, very stark uh, picture of inequality in labor markets and in uh, 
uh, unpaid work at home. Thank you. So hi everyone, thank you for attending this presentation. Hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, before starting, I would like to thank you know, wider for organizing this conference and for giving us the opportunity to present uh, this joint paper. So this paper looks at the effect of social distancing measures on poverty and labor income inequality in Latin countries. So as we know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a highly important consequences in terms of the economic costs. And due to this pandemic, governments have taken measures such as implementing lockdowns, and this has had a tremendous impact on the lives of many individuals. So at the ag aggregate level, for instance, we have seen a decline in GDP. It also has had a different effect across workers, and this is what we're going to look at. So we're going to try to measure here the effect that the pandemic has had in the labor market. And in a later step, how this will have an effect on a potential increase in poverty and inequality. So there has been a growing literature um, during the pandemic trying to estimate the asymmetric effect of the social distancing measures. I'm going to be brief about this, but basically um, there was one main paper from Deagle and Neyman uh, to trying to assess the, the different um, teleworking ability uh, across occupations in the US. Uh, many applications have, be, have been proposed uh, since then uh, in other country settings. Um, there are two papers that are mostly, uh, that are the main uh, papers that are related to our paper. Uh, the one from Palomino Real and Duman. Uh, they both uh, try to estimate uh, the effects on poverty and inequality um, of this uh, differentiated impact on the labor market. So in this paper, uh, we evaluate the potential distributional consequences of social distancing on poverty and labor inequality in 20 lakh countries. We're gonna follow Palomino Real and uh, construct the lockdown working ability index. So this is an index that represents the, the capacity of individuals to remain active under the first phase of the lockdown. So I will briefly describe how this measure has been uh, constructed in our paper. Um, one thing that we, um, that we do is that we are going to compare the formal de jure lockdown policies when we assume that perfect compliance um, has taken place with de facto lockdowns, so when there is some degree of non-compliance. So we're going to change a little bit the expression of the lockdown working ability index. And once we have um, identified individuals that have been able to remain active during the lockdown, we examine changes in poverty and labor income inequality. So we first uh, start by um, computing the teleworkability index. So we use information about the task content to, uh, of occupations from the step surveys because they are collecting information on two lakh countries, uh, Bolivia and Colombia and we construct our teleworkability index. So once we've done this, we're able to, to see that it varies across countries. Uh, on average for the LAC region, it's around 12%. So 12% of people are able to, to perform their job from home. And it varies from 7.5% to 16% roughly. Um, so teleworking is not the only determinant of being able to remain active during the lockdown. So we also have to take into account workplace closures and mobility restrictions um, that have taken place during the lockdown. So um, workplace closures, what do we mean by this? Basically, essential workers um, were able to continue to work regardless of their ability to work from home. In the opposite, there were closed activities. So the workers in closed activities were not able to perform their job. So we're going to classify uh, these activities into open, closed, and not open, not closed uh, categories for each country. So this is depending on the laws, the decrees, and the press release that we have seen in each country. And so to give you a rough idea of how uh, the lockdown policies have differed across countries, here you have the lockdown intensity and duration for each country in, our, in the LAC region. So we can see that, for instance, Nicaragua hasn't implemented the lockdown. Um, on the other extreme of the spectrum, we have Argentina, for instance, that has 29% uh, of their workers that are in closed activities, so they were not able to work. In terms of the duration, for instance, Guatemala has implemented the longest uh, lockdown. 
here we're talking about the first phase of the lockdown. So we construct our lockdown working ability index and the perfect compliance. So we assume that everyone is respecting uh, the lockdown rules. So here for open activities, uh, we assume that everyone is able to work. For closed activities, no one is able to work. And for those, uh, for the activities that are not open and not closed, it's going to depend on the ability to perform the job from home. So when we compute this lockdown working ability index, we can see that um, the potential to, to remain active varies across countries. And it's around, um, around one uh, worker out of two that are able to work from, uh, that are able to remain active uh, under the lockdown in the LAC region. So this is if we assume that uh, if we're assuming that there is perfect compliance. Uh, however, we know that there are some differences, especially in developing countries, between de facto and de jure lockdowns. So this is something that we're quite interested in in this paper. Um, if you look at the how very uh, how compliance varies uh, over time over the first phase of the lockdown, you can see that it's uh, steadily decrease in all countries in the region. So this is something that we have to take into account. So we modify uh, the expression of the lockdown working ability. Uh, we're going to assume that in open activities, everyone is able to remain active. This doesn't change. However, for the closed activities, we assume that it's going to depend additionally on uh, the level of non-compliance um, uh, across regions in each country. And for those that are working from home, uh, it's also going to depend on uh, the level of non-compliance. So once we calculate this lockdown working ability, correcting for imperfect compliance, we can see that all the, the proportions of individuals that were able to remain active has increased in every country. Every country. Um, so here we have, for instance, uh, a larger increase in Venezuela or Brazil, countries where you had a higher level of uh, non-compliance. So once we have identified the individuals that uh, were able to remain active, we're going to calculate the, the potential labor income loss. So this is going to be calculated by um, taking the uh, individual annual labor income uh, in T minus one, so before the lockdown. And we're going to correct this. Um, we're going to remove the, the fraction of their annual labor income that they, lo uh, that they lost uh, due to their inability to, to to stay, um, to remain active. So this is one minus the lockdown working ability. And uh, this is multiplied by the duration of the lockdown. So uh, for how long they were unable to remain active. We compute this uh, uh, potential labor income loss under perfect compliance and under imperfect compliance to compare the two scenarios. Here you can see that um, we were examining, so we're computing lockdown incidence curves. Uh, this uh, enables us to see which part of the labor income distribution has suffered the most. So in Argentina, for instance, you can see that the bottom part of the labor income distribution has suffered much more than the um, top part of the labor income distribution. And they have suffered even more in the scenario in which you assume that there is perfect compliance. Uh, this is due to the fact that in imperfect compliance, mostly the, the most vulnerable workers um, are not complying. We calculate the impact on, uh, we, we estimate the, the impact on poverty and labor income inequality. And we can see that in most uh, countries, we see an increase in poverty and, uh, and in uh, inequality. And the changes are higher in the perfect compliance. For the same reason, uh, the most vulnerable workers are the ones that are usually uh, the non compliers we also decompose overall inequality into a between and a within country component. And we find that social distancing has led to an increase in both inequality between and within countries. Um, yet the between country inequality component has increased um, significantly more than the within country component. And we observe that the changes are greater under perfect compliance. So to summarize, uh, our results show a sizable potential increase in poverty in almost all LAC countries. We also find that uh, labor income inequality has increased uh, in most of the countries. The changes in poverty and labor income inequality are larger under de jure compared to de facto lockdowns. Uh, 
So this is uh, the jury. This is assuming that you have perfect compliance. Uh, so this basically highlights the fact that non-compliance acts as a mechanism to smooth labor income losses during the pandemic. We have seen that uh, social distancing measures are also likely to worsen inequality in Latin America and the Caribbean, both between and within countries. And so all these findings uh, in our paper, we argue that it has uh, important policy implications, uh, most notably to the, the need to assist the most vulnerable uh, workers in Latin countries in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, our presenter, for this uh, very nice presentation. So we have a, a few questions in um, our Q&A, and I have also a request for, uh, uh, for questions. I will go through this, and then you have uh, a few minutes to uh, answer them. So for Murray, we have a specific question uh, from uh, Tesfanesh. It's like, um, how do you measure child hunger in, in your research? Then uh, for Ashwini, we have a few questions. Is uh, from Richard Frown. Is there any evidence that women have been relatively less likely to move into new jobs due to gender norms in jobs, for example? Also from uh, uh, Richard Frown, we have if, a, a question about if you have the paper and you could uh, share the link. And from Nikita, we have thank you for a great presentation, Ashwini. A surprise to see men increase time uh, in domestic shores with no effect on women during the initial lockdown. For Isor, uh, we have a very interesting work. Have you been, uh, have there been uh, for law schemes in any of the countries? And if yes, do you consider them in your paper? And I will give uh, the word to Raj Katula, who's requesting uh, uh, for intervention, and then you can answer all these questions. Raj? Okay, then maybe we wait and, and you can start with uh, your responses. Anyone? I'm, I'm happy to go. First, where do I yeah. post the link to the paper? I can't... Uh... Do I just click or ask the question? Sorry? Uh, I just sort of asked a question. But I, would then... I would recommend just posting it in the general chat. In the chat, OK. So instead of ah. the Q&A. Ah, OK, OK, OK. OK. So this is uh, my the link to the paper, which is in the chat box. In the question on the women's time not changing in the first month, and Nikita, the point is that women already do a huge amount of domestic chores. Um, yeah, it didn't go up significantly, but it could be just that they were just anyway doing everything earlier, and now you know they continued that. So there wasn't that much of a change for the women, but it was. Uh, some change for the men, but it didn't last at all, actually. It went back, and it's actually now worse uh, in December. By December, it had become worse than the pre-pandemic um, period. Also, remember that this is not a time-use survey. This was an employment-unemployment survey, which basically just asked one question, roughly how much time do you spend on domestic chores? And the men's understanding of domestic chores might be very difficult from the women's understanding of domestic chores. And women always underestimate the time that they spend spend on domestic chores everywhere and men always overestimate the time that they spend on domestic chores everywhere uh, you know even in the us after the pandemic the new york times had a survey and asked partners about how much time they were spending on homeschooling and the divergence in the 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 men's and the women's answers were staggering uh, you know, in the in the same family, and so you know, take your pick about who was uh, who was right about the time they were spending. So it's a rough measure, but it it indicates something. On the question of uh, did they move to were there gender norm related constraints in other jobs? I don't think so. I don't think there's any evidence. In fact, employment creation has itself been an issue. You know, um, in India, ever I mean from before the pandemic, but that's worsened during the pandemic. So it's really no jobs, you know, rather than 
uh, jobs being there, which women, I mean, that's, that does happen on the margin, uh, particularly transportation constraints are cr critical uh, for rural women. They can't get to the place of work. So even if hypothetically there was a job that they could do in the district center, they can't get there. Uh, so those things do matter. But overall, there is a huge excess supply of labor. You know, there's just unemployed people, uh, men and women both. So it doesn't seem to be a gender norm story. And I actually have another paper which I didn't present here where which strongly questions the gender norm story. I can talk about that later, but I don't want to uh, monopolize all the time. Thank you very much. Uh, Morai, maybe you can answer your question. Yeah, thank you very much. So really good question about how we measure child hunger. And in this instance, one needs to understand that this uh, panel survey was being implemented even under lockdown conditions where we would have been breaking the law to do in-person field work. So it was a telephonic questionnaire and it, and it bears that uh, those weaknesses in questions like that. So the measuring child hunger would be related to a question that says in the past month or in the past two weeks, have any uh, of the children in your household experienced hunger? rather than saying, has anyone in your household experienced hunger? Um, and uh, so, so that's how it would be measured with all the weaknesses associated with that. In the longer run panel studies, one can do anthropometrics and one actually measures uh, the evidence of sustained hunger. Um, a, a quick answer then to a very interesting question that was also put in the chat about furloughed schemes. Schemes for furloughed workers. So obviously, if you're going to do lockdowns, you suspend employment. And employers respond to that in different ways. Some of them suspend earnings at the same time. Um, and, uh, and so I think it's a very interesting question because this issue of furloughed work is well, well discussed in developing in developed country labor markets but completely not very well discussed i don't think in developing country labor markets and um so in south africa there was a specific scheme uh, called the temporary employment uh, relief scheme which which allowed but it was mediated through employers employers applied for relief for their workers under the lockdown and uh, so that was a, a scheme thought of uh, on, on the go, as it were, in the first weeks of the lockdown. Um, but uh, maybe others have some interesting examples from around the world uh, Thank about you, that. Marie. Thank uh, you. Isor? Yes. Um, so to, to answer shortly, uh, I, we haven't really included uh, follow schemes and social assistance programs. Uh, this is something that we discussed in the paper, how this would uh, affect our estimations. The, the only reason we didn't uh, include them is, uh, is the fact that you can't really identify from surveys who has been receiving, uh, uh, I mean, who has been uh, benefiting from a social assistance program or has been uh, um, part of a follow law scheme. Uh, so this is something that we, we were not able uh, to do because we were using surveys, uh, not uh, surveys that have been conducted during the pandemic, but surveys that uh, were conducted one or two years before in order to have uh, the first estimations, uh, potential estimation on uh, poverty and inequality. So, so of course, uh, based on the thinking about taking this into account, uh, it, it, would, uh, it, it might differ a bit the estimations. Uh, yes, a very quick uh, last question. There are other questions that we cannot address, unfortunately, but also uh, for Isor uh, Holger Xavier Hara, he asked about uh, how the poverty inequality figures um, during. The, so, the, uh, how does poverty inequality, based on official survey data collected during the pandemic in Latin American countries, compare to the estimates in the presentation? Have you checked that? Actually, that's a good uh, that's a good question. Uh, we we haven't uh, we haven't really looked at uh, the the figures because I guess now they are coming out, and we we started working on this paper uh, a year ago, so that was like really initial uh, work. But uh, yeah, it would be interesting to look at it. And uh, I, I'm I mean I think in, in terms of the incidence curves, the way it would affect uh, groups uh, over the labor income distribution. Uh, on the bottom part, since they would be receiving social assistance, uh, I mean, benefits 
so I mean, yeah, there there, there would be some uh, some slight uh, differences with uh, the initial uh, the 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 estimates that have been pro produced now. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Your, your paper was about the the initial effects. Probably there will be a lot of opportunities for following up with uh, the effects uh, during the next year. So uh, um, uh, there are other questions that we cannot address. Unfortunately, I encourage all of you who have interest in these papers to contact our great scholars that I'm sure they will follow up with you, uh, whatever is your, your question uh, about your research. So thank you very much, all of you. I don't want to take time from for the next session. Uh, that is the poster session from some early career researchers mainly. So thank you very much. Uh, and see you soon. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.